All right, so welcome to the Folio Sprint Review. Uh, we've got a lot to cover today. Um, we are uh, looking at uh, Sprints 76 and 77. We've got the teams and the team members. Um, actually, it doesn't look like there are any folks who are new to the project this time. So I'm just gonna breeze right through these slides and turn it over to Jakob um, to see if he has anything he wanted to cover related to the release plan. Thanks, Kate. Uh, there's nothing new. Uh, just a recap that we have the module release deadline uh, coming up for uh, for Q4 um, on Wednesday tomorrow, um, midnight GMT. So <coughs> anyone who's still preparing releases, any teams that are still working on preparing releases, please uh, 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 make sure that they're done before the deadline. Um, after that, we will have a week of Bugfest. Uh, that's that's next week. Uh, bugs will be uh, reported. Many bugs will be reported, and they will be triaged and um, hopefully fixed uh, by uh, responsible teams. And we hope to have um, that process uh, completed by December 18th. Uh, and then on December 20th, um, Apple buys or Q4 will become public. Uh, so, uh, just in time for Christmas. Um, could you move? Yeah, thank you. Um, and also, uh, similarly to what we have done for 3.2, uh, Q4 will see some uh, potentially see some hotfix releases. Uh, those hotfix releases will be uh, will be released uh, throughout Q4, Q1 uh, 2020, and up to one month after Q1 is out. Uh, so we'll keep on supporting uh, those people, those organizations that are running uh, Q4 um, uh, for at least uh, another quarter. Uh, there's no updates to the definition of done, um, so everything remains as it was um, um, uh, already announced on the previous print reviews. Uh, I'll just mention that this time around we really hope to see migrations in place for all the schema changes. Uh, those migrations um, have not been thoroughly tested uh, since we did not have a dedicated environment to perform that sort of testing. The platform team is working on building such environment, but it's not going to be in place. Um, it's not going to be ready for um, uh, for uh, for Q4. So um, so please uh, uh, make sure that those uh, those migration scripts that, you, that your teams are providing. Developers are providing for the schema changes are being tested locally um, because they're essential for a successful migration from 3.2. And that's all I have. Uh, and I think the time is of an essence, Kate, I'll turn back to you. Okay, great. Thanks, Jakob. I'm just going to mute everyone. So when it's your turn to talk, just you'll have to unmute yourself. All right, great. Thank you, Jakob. And um, if I can move to the next slide. Oh, yes. All right. Why can I not move to the next? There we go. Okay. So each of the teams has um, documented their sprint highlights. We're not going to go through these. Instead, we'll just jump right into the demos which I will get to eventually here, yeah. So we got a bunch of teams um, that need to demo. So um, let's try to keep these to 10 minutes or less, ideally. So let's start with Thunderjet. Alexi. Yep, hello. Hello. Uh, I'm not sure if Dan is going to uh, No, I'm so, so go right ahead. <laughs> cool, so Can I'm going to... Oh, I have to stop sharing. Uh, okay, let me share my screen. So I hope you can see it. But, uh, I'm going to show you changes uh, that we were working on uh, in scope of receiving and checking workflow uh, for orders uh, and uh, integration with inventory, uh, especially item status. 
So uh, previously we uh, we were setting uh, item status as uh, in pro uh, despite of it, uh, now we have uh, changed this. I have an, one order. Uh, it has several P lines, one for receiving, one for checking. Uh, what we should pay attention it title by folio dem demo. Uh, it has two items quantity. And um, and yeah, let's uh, uh, order is, is in patent status. So while we open in this, it uh, does appropriate things in inventory. I mean, creating instances uh, and items, especially for receiving flow. Uh, for check-in, it, uh, I believe, just create instances. Uh, uh, so let's go to the inventory. Uh, here we have our uh, instances. Uh, let's go to receiving. Here we have our two pieces. Uh, Let's uh, go to one of them and uh, add barcode to that. Uh, let's save it. Uh, here we have uh, barcode and we can go to checkout uh, and uh, to get item status checkout. Okay, let's return to the inventory. And uh, here we have uh, one piece with barcode is checked out and another one on order. Let's go to the order receive flow. Here we have our photo demo for receiving. And on a receive screen, we have two pieces. One item status is checked out, and uh, the second one still on order, but we are going to change it in process. However, we will not change uh, status checked out. So let's uh, select all of them. And uh, actually here we have, there should be a, a final statuses. Here we end up on receiving history and uh, in uh, inventory, we can observe our new statuses uh, in process and check out uh, left as is. Uh, regarding check-in flow, uh, we can go to appropriate purchase order line and uh, check-in flow. Here we have, we can add piece. Uh, We can add it, uh, however, uh, uh, we might have not uh, add item. So there will be piece. We can uh, check it in. However, since there are no uh, any items regarding this uh, instance, we will set item status undefined or piece status. Uh, basically, that's it uh, from receiving uh, flow changes. Uh, thank you. I think we can proceed with Andre. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Alexei. Alexei. I believe you can see my screen. Yes. Okay. Hi all. I'm going to demonstrate uh, connection between funds, groups, and ledgers in uh, finance app. Uh, we'll make some transactions to see how money uh, calculation works. Uh, we'll see how 
uh, they will change it on the UI side and also we will see, we'll try to see connection uh, between the orders and the finance apps. So let's go to finance to see. Uh, ledgers, uh, let's check one of them, click on. Uh, we see ledger details um, and uh, two accordions uh, with related groups and funds. Um, please pay your attention on uh, these numbers uh, is located and available and available. Um, and uh, the same uh, for funds and groups. Here we can see that the uh, allocated numbers is almost uh, for thousand dollars and uh, we will work with uh, African history so we need uh, to see these uh, numbers it's uh, 25 uh, thousands so to see the calculation changes we need to make transactions so let's go to fund I select our African history fund uh, we see that uh, it has a current budget and let's go so mm, one more we have allocated at uh, 25,000 and let's try to make transaction so uh, we need to select to its our fund African history here we can uh, select um, any of them but uh, to see changes on ledger so we need uh, to select uh, one of them that doesn't connect to the same ledger or we can even um, keep it uh, empty so let's keep it empty at one thousand dollars and uh, let's confirm yes so we see that uh, the numbers was changed and uh, you can see on the ledger details numbers we see that uh, there was changes too and uh, here we can see changes in and even in groups uh, we can see the same changes it was uh, located more than one thousand dollars um one uh, magic for today it's um, connection between uh, finance and orders up uh, let's go to orders i prepared order let's uh, find uh, it by tag so it's so useful to use tags and uh, we can see pure line details uh, and um, we need fund distributions yes we can see that uh, we use uh, fund our African history fund and the amount is um, $1,000. So when we open our order, we will see changes on finance that uh, was changed uh, unavailable. It was increased uh, on one thousand dollars the same changes were when it was happened uh, were happened on our african history fund so i think that it's for today from my side if any questions feel free to ask all right i love how you worked in the tags there um <laughs> and and it's a great example Ta tags are pretty much everywhere in the acquisitions apps now and can be incredibly helpful whether it's just doing a little demo like this where you're trying to um, keep track of records or something more complicated and um, i think one of the things with with uh, good development is some of this looks kind of easy it's just a matter of making numbers add up properly I cannot tell you the amount of work that Dennis and the developers have done to make these numbers add up properly when they're jumping around from all these different states. So it's it's so good to see this all coming together. Um, could I ask again, you didn't take that money from anywhere specific. Did you explain that? Could you explain that to me? So allocations, uh, it, it's, it's always important to remember the money in 
uh, folio is typically just a reflection of money that is someplace else in real accounts. So initial allocations, the money kind of appears from nowhere, and I'm I'm allocating, you know, twenty thousand or two hundred thousand into this account at the beginning of the fiscal year. We also can do um, transfers of money. So maybe I'm allocating a million dollars into history for the year, but now I'm gonna transfer it down into more specific funds to break that million up into different regions of the world or different time periods or different formats or something. So it depends what you're doing. So if you were yep. doing that, you'd put the from in the bigger history. Line. Exactly, yep. Okay. Exactly. yep. There, uh, some libraries have what they call sweep funds, where at the end of the year, they gather up all the unused money from their um, unrestricted funds and gather it up into one last pot that maybe ends up with a couple thousand dollars and then they can spend it all their own. All right, looks great. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right, the next team to demo is Spitfire with Yuri. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Hi, all. Uh, so now you can see my screen, right? Yeah. Uh, so our team uh, uh, improved request preferences flow and uh, improved the support of uh, the items uh, the that are in a waiting for delivery uh, status. Uh, so, uh, let's move on uh, step by step. So uh, here you can see uh, these items with this uh, with this uh, statuses uh, waiting delivery and uh, waiting pickup. So first thing uh, uh, which I want to show you is that uh, uh, we uh, disabled uh, disabled uh, possibility uh, to. Uh, I change uh, the fulfillment uh, preference for the items uh, with the statuses. Uh, so here you can see that uh, it is disabled and uh, I'm not able to change it. The same thing is uh, with the item which is open awaiting for pickup. One second, yeah, this one. Here is the same thing. Uh, so another uh, thing uh, which uh, was improved is uh, that uh, we are not able uh, to um, add or uh, uh, change uh, the whole shelf expiration date, uh, which you can see here for uh, item is waiting pickup status, uh, but you are not able to uh, set it for uh, the item is waiting for delivery. Let's check it. Let's go to this item. Let's try to edit, and here you can see uh, like an empty field. Uh, another thing uh, is. Uh, about uh, actions uh, uh, for uh, uh, this item with new status. Uh, so here, uh, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, uh, now we are in uh, view details mode and uh, here uh, for this item on the table to uh, do moving of the request. Uh, also, uh, what I want to show you is that uh, it is not allowed to uh, do the reordering of, of the uh, open awaiting delivery uh, items. Uh, in the, in the queue, so uh, here you can see two items, and one of them is uh, awaiting for delivery. And uh, let's try to reorder these items. Uh, here you can see uh, that uh, in table uh, the item uh, is uh, on the same position as it was before uh, it returns to its initial position. And here we can see uh, like uh, a message uh, that uh, it is not allowed uh, to uh, change the position of weight and delivery items. Let's move on. 
and uh, another thing uh, uh, is uh, about uh, 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 new model, like new feature on uh, chicken. So let's try to uh, check in uh, this item with this uh, barcode. Let's wait a little bit. And uh, here you can see that uh, our team added a new model, uh, which called Road for Delivery Request for uh, these specific items uh, uh, with uh, this information, which is related to the item uh, and uh, possibility uh, doing uh, uh, a checkout uh, when item is uh, first in the queue and has a waiting for delivery uh, status. Also, uh, like we have uh, here, uh, two options. So uh, we can adjust print slip and, uh, for example, put uh, an item uh, to a specific bin or uh, or a shelf. Uh, let's do it. Yeah, here you can see uh, uh, like a, li a little bit information about uh, uh, about the user and uh, his location. We can do check in again uh, to check uh, uh, whether we are able to uh, check out it. Yeah, let's skip print slip and let's do the check out. Here you can see that uh, uh, we are redirected to check out application from check in, and uh, here we can. Uh, uh, see like predefined uh, data uh, uh, with uh, information about borrower. Uh, it is uh, the same last name which is so in uh, the staff sleep uh, uh, and uh, information about item. Uh, so yeah, I think uh, that's it. Thank you for attention. Thank you, Yuri. There are so many pieces to this feature. It's really nice to see it coming together. I think we're really almost done. It's great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay. So Vega is next with Svetlana. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm starting sharing my screen. Let me know when you see it. We see it. Uh, today, I'd like to demonstrate two features uh, as there are in transient report and uh, blocked patron can successfully place a request. Um, I'd like to demonstrate uh, first in transient report. Uh, go to uh, snapshot um, and go to yeah, inventory page. Mm -hmm. uh, I've already mm -hmm. prepared so some item status with uh, interest in the uh, status. Search uh, items in transit. As we can see, we have uh, three items. And now uh, click to inventory button and uh, download in transit items report. Uh, as we can see, in transit report uh, um, has been successfully downloaded. And now open this report. Uh, there are three items, uh, and uh, the report uh, includes uh, items information such as um, barcode, title, contribute, uh, contributors, call numbers, enumeration, volume, year, and other fields, and also request information such as request type, um, request uh, pattern group, um, request creation de uh, date, uh, and others one. Uh, that's all from this story. Do you have any question? Does it also show um, where it was is coming from and where it's going to? I can answer that. Um, those stories are um, coming. The work wasn't finished to have those fields in it, but or have those fields 
present for the item, but they'll be added to the report soon. Awesome. Looks good. Mm -hmm. uh, let's move to uh, another story. Uh, it is uh, block pattern can successfully place a request. Uh, to demonstrate this story, go to request page. Uh, I've already prepared a blocked user. Uh, click to new request button and try to create um, a new request. Uh, fill item information, uh, fill request information with uh, blocked uh, pattern. Uh, as a result, we have a message uh, a pattern blocked from requesting. Uh, close the pop-up and click to new request button. Choose. Uh, as we can see, we have uh, a pop-up with request not allowed message. Uh, that's all from this story. Do you have any questions? Hi, Svetlana. Uh, what will happen if the request is being uh, posted directly to the APA call to mod circulation? Um, I can um, open network tab and we can um, uh, try to create new request. Um, we have this uh, validation on the backend side, uh, so uh, you are just um, show this message. One second. Uh, now um, open response. Uh, as we can see, we have message pattern block from requesting. This is um, this message is coming from backend side. So if we directly um, using Postman to um, use this um, Great, endpoint. thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, this confirms that the rules are applied on the uh, backend. Thank you. Uh, do you have uh, other questions? Uh, so I'm stopping sharing my screen. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Svetlana. All right, so up next we have FullyJet and Anne Marie's kicking off. So just quickly, um, Taras is going to uh, give a quick demo of the, uh, the functionality that we're using to connect up the various types of profiles to each other. So we've been talking about Lego blocks of profiles for quite a while, and this is how we're going to start putting them together, the associators. Um, and then Kate is going to show the um, work that has basically consumed all of the backend developers for this quarter, which is getting PubSub up and running. Um, so she's going to show kind of a simplified model of that. Great. All right, Taras, are you ready? Yes. Uh, let me share the screen. Can you see it now? Well, not yet. At least I can't. Uh, nope. Yes. Okay. So, um, as you can see, uh, we have uh, action profile settings open. Uh, I have chosen this one, uh, this type of profiles, because we have several types of the other profiles associated with them. Um, so we can go to the um, profile details uh, view and um, we will see that um, we have map field mapping profile and uh, several um, uh, job profiles associated with single action profile. So um, now uh, we see um, here and here we, we have uh, a single component uh, which uh, is configurable uh, on, uh, it knows how to show uh, different types of profiles. 
um, and show them as multi-select uh, list and single-select list. Um, uh, as far as uh, we can um, associate only one mapping profile with uh, single parent action profile, so we have a single select list. Um, when we will click uh, this um, link, we will be uh, put to uh, associated profile details. So let us return. Um, also, uh, we have some options button. It, it is not uh, uh, active for now, but uh, there will be some bulk actions in the future sprints. Um, we can uh, hit edit. Um, and uh, here we, we can see the, uh, that same component, a profile associator in uh, edit mode. Uh, so um, as far as we cannot, my, uh, cannot associate uh, more than one mapping profile to a single action profile, we have select profile button disabled. And on an opposite way, um, we can uh, associate uh, any amount of profiles, of uh, uh, job profiles to single action profiles. So we have select profile button enabled. Um, we have an link button. Um, uh, now we have scroll here, uh, but uh, when the lists will be centralized uh, as uh, card views, uh, scroll will be disappeared and all the form including actions, uh, all the lists including actions will be visible at once. Uh, so um, the second um, component uh, that is participating in this uh, is um, uh, profile, uh, find improv profile plugin, uh, uh, which will be released in this release. Um, it is also new. Um, it also can be uh, configured as a single select or multi-select list. Uh, by the props, um, it can like the any actually um, plugin finder plugin. It can be uh, searched uh, and uh, also you can select one or several profiles and associate them to the list from where. You you were call, calling this uh, plugin. Also, we can uh, remove some profiles, uh, or actually not remove, but unlink. Uh, so uh, we confirm and we can unlink. We can uh, actually unlink even single profile, uh, which is associated here, and we will see the empty list with uh, select profile button is active. So. Uh, now you can see a uh, single select uh, configured list um, and you can uh, select any profile to associate. Um, as far as uh, we have uh, this selected profile already associated with another uh, parent profile, parent action profiles, uh, we have a confirmation that asks us to uh, decide whether we really want to uh, relink uh, this selected profile from the previous parent to, uh, to the current one. So if we hit cancel, it will be uh, just left alone. Uh, and if we will uh, choose relink, it will appear here. So um, uh, actual, actually save the form. Um, uh, with uh, form save process with all the profiles associated and all the changes uh, is a part of the next uh, backend task because we need a single backend transaction here. So uh, it will be uh, uh, demoed in one of the next sprints. Uh, also, I can show you that uh, we have um, 
will have this profile associator component in any of the other uh, profiles that could be associated. So you can see this. Uh, this is uh, uh, again the single component which can uh, can be rendered in uh, editable or static or non-editable mode for details. Uh, also, um, this is uh, basically all for uh, presentation part. I just can um, notice that uh, I'm showing this from local machine because uh, we have uh, problems with uh, our old big test bug uh, uh, for timeouts uh, failing. So once it will be tackled down uh, somehow, uh, this will be available on uh, hosted environments. So if you have any questions, uh, and uh, another one, uh, that same mechanism uh, will, will be uh, used uh, to fulfill much profile details uh, part, like uh, all of the Lego that Anne-Marie has uh, mentioned here. Uh, and also, uh, we will uh, we will uh, make use of this same mechanism in mapping profiles to fulfill uh, mapping chains. So now that's all. Uh, if you have any questions, please ask. Thanks, Stras. That looks great. I guess we're ready to hand off to Kate. Uh, hello, everyone. Just um, it says I cannot start sharing. Taras, have you stopped okay, sharing? Okay, now I can. Ah. So just let me know when you see it. Yes, there we go. Okay, perfect. So uh, I would like to demo the first version of PopSup that will be released tomorrow. Uh, but before I start, uh, I would like to mention that uh, it is not yet available on any hosted environment because uh, Kafka is not configured properly there yet. Uh, but as soon as this issue is resolved, we will make sure that PopSup is also added to the hosted environments. Uh, but for now, I will use my local Vagrant environment. And uh, uh, I have here a snapshot backend core Vagrant box where I added um, the PopSup module itself and two sample modules. One of them is registered as publisher and another module is registered as a subscriber in PopSub. Um, the publisher module uh, exposes some sample API and when a request is received, um, well, some, uh, uh, some business logic is executed on backend and um, an event is being published. Um, subscriber is interested in this event, so uh, it sh when uh, it receives it, it should create uh, a new entity. And I will just go ahead and uh, uh, send this uh, sample request to publisher. Uh, if we go to the PubSub logs now, we can see that it received an event and it delivered this event to the uh, entities endpoint. Entities endpoint is provided by uh, subscriber modules uh, when it was registered in PubSub. And if we go to the uh, subscriber log, we can see that new entity was created. And uh, here is an extremely simplified diagram of what just happened on backend. Uh, so here is our post request to sample API. Uh, publisher module has a, a PubSub client dependency and it uses it to publish uh, this event. And PubSub uh, delivers this event to the uh, callback address that was provided by subscriber. And then subscriber uh, creates an entity. So it's just uh, a simplified flow 
but in context of uh, data import, an event can be published like um, new Mark bibliographic record created in SRS. And then um, modules like MarkCat or Modern Inventory um, that care about such things uh, would be registered as subscribers and receive this event. And in case of mod inventory, it can uh, then uh, create a corresponding inventory instance and in its turn publish an event that an instance was created. Uh, and other modules interested in new instances would be receiving those events and so forth. So basically, uh, PubSub provides functionality uh, to register uh, publishers and subscribers um, and uh, um, publish uh, an event. It also uh, delivers those uh, events to the registered subscribers. So all this work happens on the backend and uh, a digital documentation on how to use uh, PubSub client will be available uh, pretty soon. Um, I think uh, it will be uh, published at the end of this sprint. And that's all what I wanted to share. Uh, if you have any questions, please contact me or any other FolioJet team member and we will get back to you. Thank you. Thanks, Kate, for this overview. It's really exciting to see that. Thank you. Coming together. All right, so let's see. Next we have uh, Concord, Dimitro. Uh, hey, everybody. Um, one moment, I'll share my screen. Can you see it? Yes. So today I will be presenting loan anonymization and uh, an item status date feature. So uh, let's jump right in. Uh, so for the for today's demo, I will be using Folio Snapshot Core stable environment because uh, currently there is a bug on the snapshot that prevents me from uh, demoing there. Uh, it, it should be fixed really soon. Uh, so I have uh, prepared some data beforehand. We have two loans issued to a person and one of the loans has an attached fee, fee fine. Uh, now I'm going to go to settings and loan history settings. Um, there are two groups of um, uh, anonymizing uh, settings. So um, you can sp specify uh, how uh, clo how uh, close loans will be anonymized. So either immediately or after an interval or never. And if you want to have an exception for loans with fees and fines, so we, there are exact same settings right here. So uh, as you can see, I said uh, anonymized loans that were closed after one minute and never anonymized uh, lo loans with fees and fines. Now I'm going to uh, close uh, those two loans. Okay, and another one. Um, and uh, now they move to uh, users close loans. And uh, in order to see the results, we will have to wait for one minute. And in the meantime, I'm going to show you another feature that we worked on. Uh, so it's, um, it's a separate field for item status date. I'm going to open an item. So this item has been uh, previously checked out and 
the status date is set to 1101. And there's also this um, last updated date that was uh, earlier in the system. So there are two aspects of this feature. Uh, so if I edit an item, Uh, just about anything. So, uh, as you can see, this last updated date has been um, changed and the item status date has uh, remained the same. Uh, now, if I check this item in, and go to back to item details, Uh, so this uh, item status date has been updated because this status uh, has been changed. Yeah. Uh, not that one, this one. Okay. And now go, going back to loan anonymization. So I'm going to open uh, a patron and his loans. And as you can see, uh, a loan with uh, without a fee fine has been anonymized. It means that uh, the link to user has been removed from that loan. And this, this is why this loan is no longer visible on users closed loans. And because we said <coughs> uh, never anonymize loans with fees and fines, it is here. So this is probably all. If you have any questions, feel free. Thanks, Dimitro. That looks awesome. Uh, looks like Sergi is also going to do a demo for Concord. Okay, I hope you can hear me. Yep. Hello, How everyone. To stop sharing my screen. <laughs> <laughs> hmm, good question. There you go. Okay, thank you, guys. Okay. I hope you can see my screen. We can. Uh, great. So, ladies and gentlemen, I want to show you another three features that our team has worked on over the past two sprints. And the first one is in the Concord team's favorite module. It's a circulation rules editor. As you can see, in addition to the overdue fine policy, the lost item policy has been created as well. Uh, lost item fee policies uh, should be populated from the setting circulation lost item fee policies uh, section. I've already created uh, some items in advance. And now I'm going to clean it. When we want to set up the policy for lost items, we can select the appropriate uh, item from the circulation policy menu. And after that, we can select a specific policy name from the drop down menu. And also, I do want to mention that uh, lost item fee policy type is required. It means if the circulation rule doesn't contain a lost item fee policy, or doesn't contain, contain a specific item for these policies, we can save the circulation rules. Yeah, after clicking the save button, the error message appears at the bottom. And that's all about the circulations rules editor. And another functionality I wanna show is the display of the process of scanning the item barcode. In checkout application, after selecting the button and entering the item barcode, I'm going to click the enter button. Uh, during the scanning process, instead of the text, no item have been entered yet, uh, loading ellipses should be displayed. 
for better visibility, I'm going to emulate the slow connection. Sorry, it's a second. After clicking the enter button, here it is, the loading ellipses, and it helps the user to understand that the scanning process is ongoing and there is no need to press enter button again, which can lead to the, uh, to the error. Uh, and the last feature I wanna show you about permissions. I've already created the user with uh, checkout uh, circulation items permission. I've already created a loan policy. Loan policy, which, which is not uh, loanable. Uh, also, we have a circulation Sorry. Also, we have a circulation rules in which uh, in which this uh, policy, a loan, uh, not loanable loan policy, matches to specific type of material. Uh, in this case, microform, and we have the inventory item in which there is a material type microform with this rule. In another tab, uh, we have the application with our newly created user. Uh, he is logged in. When the user tried to check out uh, this inventory item, We've got a model with a message that the item is not loanable. And since the user is not have a permission, check out all permissions, the override button near the close button is missing here. That's all from my side. Thank you for your attention. Ask me question as you have. Thanks, Sergi. Those are really nice improvements. Um, okay, so then next up is Stripes Force with Rasmus. Sorry, sorry. Can you find the stop share button? I can't remember where it is. Oh, I can stop it for you. Let me stop it. And now I can stop sharing for myself, if I can figure that out. Oh yeah, here it is, it's, yes, there we go. Okay, Rasmus, you should be able to share now. Rasmus, are you on? Oh, yes, sorry, I just had a little, little problem, sorry. No worries. Just give me one moment here. There we go. Can you see my screen? Yep. Perfect. So uh, I just wanted to demo uh, a few changes that I made this uh, sprint. Uh, one of those is the uh, updated main navigation of the Folio app. And um, as you can see now, you can see the um, service point directly here in the, uh, in the header, visible here. And uh, once you change it, of course, it will be uh, changed here as well. So that's the one thing. And another thing here is the um, once you resize the window now, you'll see that it will adjust the number of uh, visible uh, apps, which means that if you have a large screen, you will be able to see uh, a lot of apps and smaller screens that will adjust accordingly. And the apps that you won't see uh, visibly directly here, you will be able to see in the, in the app dropdown. And um, in some upcoming changes, we're gonna, uh, with uh, uh, some, some nice work from John Coburn, 
we're going to be able to uh, navigate these drop downs using arrow keys, which is a feature that has been requested. Uh, this is not live yet, but it will be live soon. Um, and the other thing I wanted to demo is the um, new tooltip component. And you can see that one in inventory, actually. Once you hover here, you'll be able to see this little tooltip. And that's um, a very, very nice way to show some, some usual contextual information for the user, especially for these different actions that only shows an icon. Uh, you'll be able to, to hover uh, this and get some more information. And just some practical information for developers in the um, storybook that you can access on ux.folio.org slash storybook. You'll be able to um, to see the, the documentation here. And there are some, some information about accessibility. Because of course, as you probably already know, we have some very strict uh, requirements when it comes to accessibility in the Folio um, applications uh, and Folio in general. So it's very important that um, you always make sure that you can access these tooltips with hover, but also with focus. Um, and there are some guidelines in the, um, the uh, readme here that describes how to use it in a, in a proper way so that you make sure that even for uh, people that are using screen readers, they will be able to access the same information as people uh, that are, yeah, that actually can see the tooltips. So, um, so yeah, that's all for me. I think this is a nice little uh, additional component that could be useful for, um, for module developers. I'm going to stop sharing now. Thanks, Rasmus. Those are really cool improvements. Um, I have a question about the tooltips and mobile devices, because I seem to recall from, I mean, this was quite a long time ago, but I think the original guidance from UX was that we shouldn't use tooltips because uh, they were non-functional or they didn't function well on mobile devices. Is that, did you guys figure out a way around that or are we, we're just not concerned about that issue at this point? Um, I'm actually not sure about this. Uh, that's a good question. Um, I believe that they will show up on mobile um, uh, if you like uh, tap and hold on an, on an element. Okay. But, um, but it's actually something that I'll, I'll, uh, I'll look into. Cool. I mean, I definitely think they could be really useful. Yep. All right, thanks, Rasmus. Um, okay, so Core Functional is up next with Matt Connolly. Hi, everyone. Um, let me pull up my screen here. Okay, so I've got actually a bunch of different uh, changes and improvements to inventory to show you today, which several people have worked on. And um, let me start with a couple of changes to the display of, of records here. So the first thing is under holdings um, in the uh, accordion uh, headers here, uh, we have call number, but now we've added call number, prefix, and suffix as well. So down here, I've added a prefix of video, a suffix of plus plus for some reason. And so um, this is now displaying the full call number with, with all three components. Um, and uh, this one hasn't been changed, so it doesn't have a prefix or suffix there. Um, also, in the same view, we have status updated date. Um, this previously was not showing anything um, useful, but uh, this morning I put in a, an instant status update, batch loaded, and it has the correct date and time there. Um, and then on the, um, let's see, effective location, at the top of the item record. So if I go into an item record now, uh, there we go. Uh, we've now added effective location at the top here, so it's easy to access. It's still down at the bottom somewhere as well, down here with the other location data, but just for quick checks, it's now up at the top as well. So next I'm gonna go into the uh, search and filter pane here. And again, we have this divided up now into three tabs for instance, holdings, and item. And we've started to uh, flesh out some of the options down here. So now under instance, we've got effective location, resource type, um, language, which now has many more languages than last time we showed this. 
uh, options for staff suppression and, and discovery suppression. Under holdings, we have effective location again, holdings permanent location, and also a suppress from discovery. And item has item status, effective location, holdings permanent location, material type, and also suppress from discovery. So uh, depending on which pane you're in, some of these will return um, the same results and some will return different results. So they're all returning instance records, but something like effective location, which is only um, applied to the item record, will return the same thing in all three panes if you search under holdings or instance. Um, but something like um, suppress from discovery will return a different result in each of these because uh, this can be activated at the uh, instance holdings or item level. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. Yeah, sorry about that. And item There we go. All right, then let's look at the um, search options. And these have also been developed a bit in each of the tabs. So this is the item, the options under item, holdings, and instance here has the most. Um, and now I'm gonna finally look at two of these in detail. So the first one we have keyword title contributor identifier. This has been re-indexed re on the back end to make this much more flexible than it used to be. So now I can do something like um, search for a contributor and a title or a part of a title actually, not even the full title. <coughs> appropriate record. And I can also um, put in something like a control number and a contributor. And we also get a result there. Um, actually not sure how to make my view here smaller, which is a, too bad because I wanted to show the results here as well. But we'll go on. Um, and then the final option here is, is the most interesting one probably. So there is now a query search option. Oops, and I should have cleared this out first because that doesn't make, okay. So under query search, you can actually enter a CQL query if you know the, the syntax for that. And um, it's not exactly the same as an SQL query, but it looks kind of similar. So we can start with something simple like, subjects, there, that brings up one result for us. But I can also sure. add, sorry, was there a question there? I can add an or search with something completely different and that brings up both of those. And of course, it's not limited to just subjects. Um, I can also add a contributor with a slightly funny looking syntax here. And that search works, but it doesn't bring up any results because this contributor actually is not a contributor to either of those items. But if I change this to an or, then we get three completely different results for what that's worth. Um, let's see, I can also do something like source equals folio, and this will bring up all our folio created records. And then I could, uh, if I were interested in the HRIDs, I can add that in as well. I can also do a wildcard search here. So I'm adding a, an asterisk into the uh, HRID field. 
and so that will bring up all our records um, starting with that HRID and um, I can also narrow that down a bit more so now we're going all the way into the uh, slightly higher HRIDs, and so we have a much shorter list of results. Um, yeah, I guess that, that covers it. I can put in, of course, different things as well, identifiers and, and so on and so forth, if I know the proper field names, but I think that uh, shows you what can be done. And unless there are questions, I can hand it off to Mikhail next. M Matt, or maybe Charlotte, is, is the query syntax um, documented someplace or are there plans to document it someplace? Yes, um, all the um, uh, property names, because that is what you are using, you are using the property name, uh, um, they are documented in um, uh, the inventory master spreadsheet and then we are working on uh, the wiki page where right now there's added uh, different examples and we will uh, improve that um, uh, list of uh, yeah uh, examples on how to do these query search and then we uh, hope for that we can um, what uh, Rasmus uh, just showed that we can then have um, this information and then link to the uh, uh, query search page um, from there great that's gonna this is gonna be so helpful yeah, and especially because we are, uh, for the MVP, we don't have the advanced search, but with the query search, we are able to use the Boolean operators. Mm -hmm. So, really nice. Agreed. These are great, great new features. Thank you, Matt. Are you ready, Michal? Uh, hi, guys. Let me just choose my sharing screen here. Um, thank you so much, Matt, for demoing this. This was so great. I had no idea that query search could be so powerful. <laughs> so it's great. Um, let me just move this here. So I have just a couple small small changes here to show you. The first one is under um, your requests module. And what we added just recently is those two fields here relate, related to cancellation reasons. Um, so those are only under close and cancelled requests, and we can actually now see why something was cancelled. Um, this was not there before, so this is a small quick fix. Um, the other change we introduced, let me just, I'm having some trouble here with the zoom here today. Um, the, other, the other little change here, which we fixed recently, is was, was related to navigating between you know, user module and request module. Uh, in some of those cases, we, we used uh, user barcode instead of the user ID. And when the barcode, barcode would change, um, that link to the request app would be broken. So we fixed that. And now when, we, when you navigate from user to um, requests app, you can see that we are actually using the, uh, the user ID here. Uh, so when I go back and I will change the barcode to something, I'm not sure, something else here, I can still open requests app without any issues. Um, and the last thing I wanted to show you is something which we demoed last time, but it was kind of broken. So it's this reordering queue um, view where you can drag and drop uh, different items um, in the queue to reorder them. Um, as you can see, this this is working correctly now, so we had to make a couple changes to it. Uh, there, was, there was a question about accessibility um, last time, and I just wanted to add that the accessibility is supported here. You can use the keyboard, um, but I was running into some issues with um, uh, one of the components we are using here. So I might have to talk to John Coburn to just make sure that I'm doing the right thing here. Um, and that will be it for me. Please let me know if you have any questions.
Thanks, Michal. Nice fixes, and I love that feature with the drag and drop. Okay, so the last up is Anton. He's going to do a QA update. Are you on, Anton? Yes, I am just fighting my mute button for a second. <laughs> Uh, okay, I'll be very brief. Uh, so the code coverage, uh, well, it's we actually have one breakthrough that checkout is over eighty percent. It's been long in waiting, but now we achieve that goal. So great job, guys! Everything else is pretty much status quo. Little bit growth in UI inventory, so. Uh, I understand that you guys all um, bear it with features, but please, if you have a chance, keep growing the coverage. Um, QA updates are um, at the link as, as usual. Um, so off to the next slide. The trend for the bug accumulation continues. Just want you to be aware of that. We keep growing the gap between open and closed. So any uh, chance you have uh, to close defects or even triage and close something that never going to be closed would help to keep this clean. Uh, so please be cognizant of the, the, uh, the gap and try to uh, keep the bug count for your module uh, modules um, as low as possible because uh, it's a theory of broken windows, right? So if windows are broken, then the neighborhood is not maintained. So bugs are broken windows. Uh, so let's uh, keep the neighborhood cl uh, clean and uh, good looking. Uh, and the next slide is on bug fest. So it's lock and loaded. We did a lot of good work uh, on um, improving test cases and uh, over 60% of test cases have descriptions now. Before we only had summaries, so there was very difficult for new testers to come in and test because there was no content in the test case. So we, uh, right now it's almost two thirds of test cases have the content so anybody can come in and execute. And at the same time, we grew number of test cases. So it's almost 700 versus 600 for the previous bug fest. So as you can see, it will be scheduled for next week. And instructions, um, uh, uh, you can find at this link. So it has schedule, instructions, and scope. And we'll be pretty much testing everything. Uh, so a few modules were excluded last time, like finance, but we'll be testing finance and market um, during this uh, bug fest as well. And um, so it's all I have for now. Just keep uh, be on the lookout for the bugs uh, that's coming, that will be coming next week. Uh, hopefully we're not gonna have uh, a lot of P1s and P2s. So just keeps my fingers crossed. And, and it's, all, it's all I have for now. Are there any questions? I, I just wanted to say a big thank you to the librarians that helped with filling in the, um, the details of the test cases. I know Colin Van Alstein went through a lot of the data import ones, like 40 of them, and filled in the, the details. And it was so helpful. I really appreciated it. Yes, I had a nice group of uh, 10 people out of the testing community. So testing community, they all volunteers, uh, library staff from different organizations. And right now this community has about 92 members. So I hope that we will have a good crowdsourcing effort during this uh, Bugfest. But in between Bugfest, I asked them to help with the test case descriptions and we made a very good progress. And I hope that if we have one more iteration like that in uh, Q1, then we should be able to close the gap and have uh, descriptions for all the test cases. That's great. Thank you for the update, Anton.
Yeah. All right. So let me just share my screen here for a couple last things. <clears throat> I'm amazed by how much we were able to get through this quickly, actually. Thank you um, to everyone who demoed for moving things along. Um, let's see. So just wanted to point out that our uh, upcoming sprints are a little different. So Sprint 78 is going to be a two-week sprint per usual. So started yesterday and um, will go until December 13th. But because of the holidays, we've decided to make Sprint 79 a four-week sprint. I know it's really long, but um, there are going to be so many people out. It just didn't seem feasible to have, uh, you know, planning meetings, sprint commit meetings sort of in the middle of the holidays. So the goal will be for POs and teams to line up a sufficient uh, sprint backlog to keep people going for four weeks um, while POs and others are, are you know, in and out on vacation. Um, and uh, we will reconvene for our next um, sprint review on January 14th, which will be at the end of the four-week sprint. And also the um, EPAM developers should be back from the uh, Orthodox Christmas as well by that time. So Kate, yeah. is, is Sprint 79 the first of Q1, Q1 2020 or is that? It's an interesting question, actually. I don't know if we did it this way last time, but it falls between, actually. Okay. So, yeah. So, while, um, yeah, it, well, it's, so we were not planning on having the Q1 development period start until January 14th, I believe was the date, the start date, or, or 13th. Um, I don't know if Mark Vexler is on, but um, we just talked about these dates uh, and I'm pretty sure that's what he said. So there's a little bit of a, a in the between time um, that doesn't really fall into one quarter or next, but any of the work that you're doing after the Q4 release on the 20th is obviously going to be targeted for Q1 anyway. Um, so, you know, we just need to kind of keep moving along, but officially it's, it's sort of an in-between period. Okay. Thanks. All right. So that's the sprints. And then um, we have uh, the plans for the coming sprints for each of the teams here. And then while I had everyone together, I wanted to also mention one last thing, which is we've um, got a new PO position open um, for a bilingual Chinese English product owner. Um, this would be a PO to join the Folio project, um, work with the community as POs do, and uh, to work with the development team based in Shanghai um, to adapt Folio to the Chinese public library market. Um, so a very sort of specialized um, PO position. This is a paid position full time, um, probably for, you know, for a year or two. Um, so if you know anyone who um, can speak Mandarin and um, may be interested in this role, um, take a look at the um, product owners page on the wiki. We've got a full job description up there. And if there are any questions, here we go. Um, they can reach out to me. So that's all I had. Is there anything anyone else wanted to mention before we close for today? Um, Kate, are, are you planning uh, for the first quarter release an interim release or not? Uh, I'm trying to remember where we landed on that. I think we said no. No, okay. And, but for Q2, there would be. Okay, so Just Q1. There's, yeah, there's so much overhead. Um, we decided it didn't make sense for Q1. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? And so the the stuff that is the, the MVP that's not going to get done, because I think a, a lot of teams have spillover, um, is, is that going to be uh, kind of, clearly spelled out well we've got an mvp dashboard don't we in jira we do um we, i mean we don't have to look at it right now it's just i'm i'm imagining that there's going to be libraries that have questions about it 
Yes, so um, definitely the we'll be doing the POs will be doing wrap up work at the end of this quarter to um, to take anything any of the features that were targeted for Q4 and didn't even get started and pushing them into Q1 and that's already started to happen to some extent um, and then. There will also be work done to split the features that were partially completed in Q4. So there'll be, there'll be work that needs to carry over and, and new features that will be created for that carryover work. Um, so that's something that we POs need to do in the next couple of weeks. Um, the community is aware already that, that there's going to be spillover work. Um, we did tag the items, the features we thought were at risk. Um, several weeks ago and um, the community has been you know given the list of at-risk features so they're already starting to review those um, but you're right we'll definitely need to kind of tighten up those lists and and communicate them out what's going to be done and and what's not going to be done and we also need to create a plan for q1 so that's something that the capacity planning team is currently working on um, we'll take take the, the spillover work um, with input on sort of relative priorities from the POs and we're gathering information about what developers will be available from the different organizations um, and at what capacity and uh, we'll have to kind of you know bring that data together and figure out what's what's feasible for Q1 and Q2. So that's in progress as well. Anything else? All right, uh, great demos everyone. Thank you so much for your time. We will share the uh, recording link tomorrow, probably. Thanks all. Thank you, bye. Bye-bye.